Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the SMEA lecture tonight. Uh, we're just going to have a few minutes for people to join us. When we've got a stable number of attendees, I'll hand over to the tonight's presenter. So thank you again all for joining us tonight. We've got about 20 people online at the moment. Welcome if this is your first time at an SMEA event with SMEA webinar. We'll just, uh, we'll just give it about 60 to 90 seconds for people to, uh, to join. Say good evening to people who are attending for the first time and welcome everyone who's uh, returning to us. Welcome everyone to the fourth SMEA webinar of 2020. Unfortunately, it does appear that we'll be having the initial webinars in 2021 on Zoom as well. We won't be able to attend the Holiday Inn or the Hotel in Sheffield. So we've got a reasonably stable number of attendees now. So uh, we'll kick off tonight's presentation. So I'd like to introduce tonight, we have two presenters rather than the normal one. Uh, we have Mike Maddock and uh, Adrian Nixon, who are going to talk to us tonight about graphene, the material that we've had a couple of previous lectures on, but perhaps was more about the science of how it was discovered and potential of how it possibly could be used. And hopefully tonight, Mike and Adrian will tell us more about the actual practical applications of graphene material um, in the world in which we live. So without further ado, I will hand over to uh, Adrian and Mike, and ask them to give tonight's presentation. Over to you, gentlemen. Thank I'm you very much. Share your screen. Thank you. Good evening. Great. Do you want to start, Mike? Uh, yeah, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Mike Maddock, and uh, obviously with uh, Adrian, and we will uh, give an introduction. Next slide. So tonight we're obviously want to talk to you about uh, graphene in terms of the science, the technology, and also the application, which we're really keen on, on terms of that application and how it's been commercialized. Um, so who are we? Um, Adrian, a graphene and 3D material scientist, and manufacturing sort of the state of the art of this material. And he's gonna be talking through the state of the art and the technology and how it's applied. Uh, and on the actual application, I'll be talking through the commercial applications. And in terms of ourselves, Adrian, do you wanna go on that? Yeah, sure. Um, Adrian Nixon, I'm the editor of the Nixon Journal. Um, this is a specialist publication that uh, takes apart everything scientific, technological, commercial in the world of graphene and 2D materials and turns it into plain English for decision makers. So it's a private journal, not an academic one. Some of our customers are the largest uh, companies in the world, so you'll have definitely heard of some of them. We might introduce them later on. Um, I'm a scientist. Uh, Royal Society of Chemistry by um, examination. I'm a chartered chemist. I'm also a board member of the International Space Elevator Consortium, so maybe uh, some questions about that later on. Quite happy to uh, I'd take those. And I'm also an advisory board member of the National Graphene and 2D Association, uh, which is the um, association that uh, promotes and connects all the graphene activity uh, across the United States. So in a nutshell, that's me so far. Uh, and myself, I'm, uh, I'm Mike Maddock. I am uh, formerly, well, but the main part role is uh, Managing Director and Co-Owner of Performance Engineers Solutions Limited, which is based in Sheffield on the Advanced Manufacturing Park. Um, in terms of other roles, I'm a visiting professor of the uh, University of Sheffield from the Faculty of Engineering. Um, also, I work with the Northern Powerhouse in terms of, uh, with the Department of International Trade as an export champion. Uh, I sit on Make UK, so very close to two manufacturing on a, on a regional and also national basis. So I am the vice chair from the regional board and I also sit on the main board uh, with over 22 members, uh, 22,000 members in manufacturing. I sit on a net zero committee um, between a uh, number of groups and also government and also the technology sustainable and innovation policy committee. And I'm also a 4.0 champion for the, for the North. And, and to add to that, I'm, I'm also with uh, Nixine Publishing has just been mentioned, I'm a, an advisory board member. And the reason you see us uh, in suits and ties with the Capitol building in the background is we were invited to um, Washington DC last year to brief senators, policymakers on Capitol Hill about the state of the art of graphene. 
And in some ways, you're getting a more updated version of the presentation than they got because things are moving so fast. And that was really interesting. We were invited over to the US because the, re the, the, the Americans realized the potential of graphene. Uh, however, they are behind the curve and we were invited over there to present with a, with a number of uh, groups um, for them to understand how it could be positioned. And that, that was a, a really beneficial trip. Yeah, yeah, good fun. So shall I move on, Mike? Yes, please. And click again. So you'd like to talk about your company. OK, a little bit more about performance engineers. So we're a high performance engineering business. So we're basically a solution business uh, of some very capable engineers with a diverse set of skill sets and we work across multiple sectors. We also have a, a data capture business, you know, so data scanning, CT scanning, etc. But the main part of our business is, is research and development and working with companies to create solutions uh, for their future products. And the reason we started working and working very closely with Adrian about three years ago um, is uh, part of our role is to understand the, um, is sorry, is to understand the um, the applications of materials and how they can be applied to clients. Uh, and then H Adrian and I started uh, talking and then we worked closely with Adrian and, and then we developed that relationship. Great. And this is us. Uh, Nixin Publishing is based at the Graphene Engineering Innovation Centre uh, called The Geek in uh, on the University of Manchester's campus. Um, there are two, well, there are now three world-class facilities on that campus. There's the Geek, the NGI, the National Graphene Institute, which some of you may have heard of, and then the uh, the latest one, the Royce, which is just opening up. Uh, the Geek, uh, well, the NGI is designed for um, really uh, high-end academic research, basic research, and then the Geek, uh, fills the gap and bridges the valley of death between the uh, where the academics leave off and where industry starts and we're sort of uh, based in that sort of spanning the gap between academics and industry as well so that's the reason we're there we're also an affiliate uh, partner at Geek so that's our that's when Covid's not around that's where we're based we're usually on the top floor in there so Mike shall I take over yes please Good. So you live just a little bit. You're wondering why we, we're talking to you. Well, um, we are fair, uh, uniquely informed about the world of graphene. Um, and, and you'll find out the pace of change in this world of graphene and 2D materials is progressing at a fantastic pace. It really is astonishing. You'll, you'll see some of the things which we're coming across. This presentation is a bit death by slides and I'm gonna uh, fire through mine fairly quickly. You'll get copies of the handouts afterwards. So all the slides that you'll see, you'll get copies of at the end if um, I think uh, the organizers will sort that for you. Um, so don't worry too much about us flying through it. But what you're going to see is just the tip of the iceberg of what we're looking at at the minute. We've just selected a few pointers. And even then, we've probably got far too many slides for the time that we got. We started off the journal because we were looking for an independent source of information about the graphene world, because it was uh, just after the Nobel Prizes awarded, there was a lot of hype out there. And we couldn't really sort the hype from the reality. So we started doing it for ourselves because nothing existed. And in the end, we sort of accidentally formed a publishing company. Um, and we're now, uh, since 2017, we've been publishing um, monthly issues of the journal, which is usually around 40 or 50 pages. And we have one topic to a page, which breaks down the complexity into plain English with some explanatory pictures. Um, and we're now about to start the fifth volume of monthly issues. So we're really muttering on with this. This is what the journal looks like. These are some special issues that we've made. Um, the blue one, the Graphene Gateway, was for the um, American Graphene Summit. We created the, uh, the briefing uh, journal for that event. Um, there are other ones that we've been commissioned to create graphene in space, uh, graphene in China. We've looked specifically at uh, activity there. And um, the basic idea about the journal is that we operate a subscription model we're completely independent, we don't take advertising, we try to take as straight down the line, as honest a view of things as we can, sometimes um, a little bit brutally honest for some people, but that's the way we like to be, and just look at the facts, separate from the hype. And that's all published, one, uh, we get one of these journals coming out every month. The, so, that's the journal. Now into the science and the manufacturing state of the art. So in the next bunch of slides, I'm going to take you through right from the very basics of graphene, right up to what's happening literally 
Probably in the last uh, couple of weeks, uh, some of the material here has been um, that you'll see. So you're getting the latest uh, view of the graphene world. Now, you'll all know that graphene is carbon, uh, molecular sort of chicken wire. I won't really go into that too much, but uh, it's just carbon arranged in a hexagonal pattern, sp2 hybridized carbon, for those of you that know that stuff. And you'll also know about the Nobel Prize being awarded. You'll also probably know that graphene was made by the sticky tape method. Um, the two chaps in the middle, that's Andre and Costia, and they're the scientists at Manchester University that isolated the uh, graphene. Now, people tend to focus on the sticky tape side of things. What, I, what actually is worthwhile bearing in mind is, look at that blank piece just to the left of Andre and Costia. Before 2004, these materials, graphene and 2D materials, were thought to be impossible to exist. There were papers in physics saying that these materials would curl up or they would just simply evaporate. They couldn't uh, exist on their own. And the reason Andre and Costia won the Nobel Prize wasn't for playing the sticky tape, it was isolating this, challenging the status quo and proving that these materials really do uh, exist in reality. And then furthermore than that, they've actually uncovered this whole landscape of 2D materials. And I'll just touch on that uh, in some of the slides. But there's a whole hinterland of other materials which are the subject probably of academic research now for the next generation. And you'll start seeing these things coming out into the real world uh, over the next uh, decade or so. And if you've never seen the Nobel Prize medal, that's what one looks like. So just a brief uh, note about dimensions and carbon, because you'll have heard me uh, talk about 2D materials. What is a 2D material? Um, it doesn't have a, a Z direction. It's just perfectly flat. Well, that's actually not true for graphene. If you think about it, an atom, even though it's 0.3 of a nanometer high for carbon, that has a Z direction. So it's probably not strictly true to say it's a 2D material. The reason it got called a 2D material in the first place is the maths that describe the way electrons move through the graphene sheet can be uh, done with just uh, mathematics in the two dimensions. They don't need a third dimension. But for our purposes, you can see that um, you can add graphene onto the X direction and the Y direction. Graphene can grow in the plane in two dimensions. You can add to that sheet and it still remains graphene. You can't grow up vertically. It becomes something else. Over here on the left hand side, we've got fullerenes, buckyballs. You'll probably have come across those. This particular one is C60. This is carbon atoms again, just arranged in a different form. And now once that's formed, you, you can't add more carbon atoms to it be, uh, because you'd change it into something else. So that is a zero dimensional material. Interestingly, just below it's cyclocarbon. That was just discovered in the last 12 months. That's uh, C18, that ring, that's another two, uh, zero dimensional material. Carbon nanotubes, you'll probably have heard of. Uh, basically roll the chicken wire up into a tube, a bit like a toilet roll, and you can grow it out from either end in just one dimension. So that's a one dimensional material. And then the, um, the other things on the right hand side here, these are just various forms of 3D material. Diamonds you'll have come across quite happily. That's a three dimensional scaffold as is amorphous carbon. So uh, you can grow, add to the, uh, the structure in three dimensions and the material remains the same. So hopefully that gives you an idea about what 2D actually means in context with the other forms of carbon. Now, I did mention that there were this la landscape of other materials. Um, I'm not going to talk about them uh, in this slide. This would take a, a presentation just on its own and probably several just to cover this adequately. Just to be aware that there is this hinterland of thousands of potential 2D materials which have been discovered now. Um, hexagonal boron nitride you've probably come across. Uh, but then there are more exotic things like these uh, molybdenum disulfide, molybdenum diselenide, tungsten disulfide, indium selenide. There's a whole range of these things. Interestingly, they, they can all stack up on their own or they can stack up together. And van der Waals forces hold these layers together, a bit like cards in a deck of a playing card, uh, in a pack of playing cards. And you can think that um, if you actually take these materials and then layer them up in different ways, you can create uh, material, brand new materials with completely different properties. So we've got the ability to create designer materials. In the Q&A, if you want, uh, we can talk about that, but I'm gonna focus on graphene at the minute because that's more than enough for our purposes. 
So what is graphene? You, you already know, you've probably heard 200 times stronger than steel, um, world's best conductor of electricity and heat. Um, yeah, that's all standard stuff. Um, it's actually very stable material, which means it's non-toxic. All the evidence that we're seeing coming out of the labs around the world shows that nobody's being killed by graphene. And that's one of the reasons I'm working in this field as well. Um, it's not going to kill you. You've got to be careful of the dusts, nanoparticle dusts you want to uh, avoid breathing in. And that's the same for any material. Uh, but graphene, it doesn't have any inherent toxic properties. Uh, you can read the rest for yourself. Uh, the, the last two are at the bottom right, the world's most fatigue resistant material, the world's most impermeable material, they've just been discovered this year, a few months ago. Uh, so this field is still advancing. Uh, even at the fundamental level. The fatigue resistant material, if you can imagine you've got um, a sheet of graphene over a hole and you're prodding it with a very sharp stick um, in what they actually use as an atomic force microscope, they found that it takes a billion presses before the material fails and that's never been come across before. Uh, the world's most impermeable material, uh, the guys at Manchester did some work looking at this um, this is Andre Geim's team. They've discovered that if you put helium in a container made of one atom thick, or one atom thin graphene, it would act as a barrier to the helium passing through, which would be equivalent to a kilometre thick wall of glass. <laughs> you just think about that, the mind boggles. We'll park that. Just on there as well, Adrian, isn't it? In terms of the one thing that's really interesting we're finding the application is, is it's you know the, the world's best conductor, well, conductive material. Uh, yeah. well, the, and, and the best is HBN. Uh, but the key, the, the, the key thing and the characteristic of this is that it actually conducts across the X and Y axis and not the Z, which is uh, really leading to some amazing opportunity, especially in flight and space flight and, and, and computing. Uh, and also, which we'll talk about later, is also the sound dampening qualities of the, uh, of the material. Yeah, there's all sorts of unexpected benefits you can get from this. And if you are planning to work with graphene, look for odd things that your customers value that you might not even be able to, uh, you might not even expect to get. And graphene might surprise you. And Mike will show you some of the, uh, the work that's been found like that later on. So because graphene can, has got all these superlative properties, then when the Nobel Prize was announced uh, in 2010, there was a hype peak. Everybody thought graphene is going to uh, save the world, make everything wonderful. They thought they were going to get uh, sheets of graphene produced at the scale of rugs and carpets or at least the size of A4 paper. But in reality, they ended up getting black powders and everybody went, oh, God, is that it? So they gave it a try, particularly in the UK, some of the early adopters put, put graphene into polymers and polymer composites and all sorts. It made it worse. And graphene got a really bad name and there was a reaction against the hype, which was still to a certain extent coming out of. Um, and we're, we'll show you what's actually been happening now because you, you may have heard that graphene is a wonder material that's been overhyped and it doesn't live up to its reputation. Well, hang on till the end of these slides because you'll start to see this stuff is really making a big impact already in ways that you probably wouldn't have heard of before. Sheet graphene is starting to be made um, and we'll talk about the industrial manufacture of that shortly. So basically this slide here shows you've got current state of the art making powders, lots of commercial applications are starting to evolve. We're seeing companies now developing this and graphene is capable of being made on the scale of hundreds of tons as powders. Single layer graphene film or metal foil, that can be made now at industrial scales too. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so we'll talk about uh, the graphene films in a minute. Most graphene at the moment, uh, graphene powders are made from graphite. And this is a lump of graphite, very high quality Sri Lankan flake graphite. Um, and gra graphite is to graphene as a pack of cards is to an individual card. So basically the manufacturing process is to exfoliate or peel apart the, um, the graphite into graphene. And that's that blue line at the top. And you've got mechanical, chemical, electrical methods of doing that. We can talk about those later. That, that's producing ton scale graphene already. There's a new method that's come out this year, uh, taking crop waste and putting it through a high temperature pyrolyzer, and that can make uh, high temperature, uh, sorry, yeah, it makes high temperature graphene from the crop waste. And again, we've got hundreds of tons of scale of graphene production already. And then just this year, James Tour at Rice University 
uh, took waste plastic and put it through an electric pulse, which then blitzes the, the carbon, tears the molecules apart, they come back together again and they form graphene and that's called flash graphene. And you'll start to hear about that. I mean, the incredible thing about flash graphene as well is that is the, the opportunity to open landfill sites and then start reutilizing the uh, everything that has been dumped over the over a hundred years, including plastics and everything else, and they're going to turn it into a usable product. Yeah, and we're also talking to the people in the space industry as well, and recycling plastics in space is uh, a big issue as well. So this could solve quite a lot of problems there for uh, for people too. Yeah, good point, Mike. Chemical vapor deposition graphene. Do you remember I showed you that metal foil with graphene on? This is how it's made. You start off with methane, CH4, the black bit in the middle is carbon, the white uh, spheres are hydrogen. Basically, you're ripping off the hydrogens and the carbon atoms li uh, line up onto the copper foil or the metal foil and they connect together in the lowest energy shape they can, which turns out to be this hexagonal chicken wire lattice. And then once the surface is covered, the reaction stops and then you can peel off the, uh, the graphene or dissolve the copper away to leave the graphene sheet. That's how it's made. However, it does contain defects. So you have um, crystal grain boundaries in the underlying metal and graphene can pick these discontinuities up. It's a bit like trying to grow graphene on crazy paving. And then you've also got this snowflake deposition where the graphene grows at multiple points, a bit like Jack Frost on your car, um, where the, um, the domains collide together. They don't quite match up and you get weaknesses there. And that's called polycrystalline graphene. And this is an example of it. So this, um, hardly anybody will have seen this photograph because I, I took this last year and we've only presented a few times uh, with this uh, graphene here. Can you see down the side of this piece of copper? Can you see that line there? To the left of it, can you see it's sort of silvery? And then to the right, we've got more of a darker coppery colour. What you're looking at there on that silvery part of this foil here, you're actually looking at a one atom thin coherent layer of chemical vapour deposition graphene. I'll say that again. You're looking at one atom thin layer of graphene. And it's amazing, you can actually see the stuff. It absorbs 2.3, 2.7% of the light that lands on it. So it's staggering. You can actually see the, the material. This is polycrystalline graphene. This is what it looks like. Um, single crystal graphene on the right hand side is this perfect uh, sheet of um, material with no defects. On the left hand side, you can see where the red lines I've highlighted in um, show the where two crystal boundaries have uh, grown together and there's discontinuities. There's also defects and vacancies there and these reduce the strength. Now on the left hand side, that's where the current manufacturing state of the art is. On the right hand side, this is where it's headed towards. So all the stuff I'm going to show you in a minute is making polycrystalline graphene, not single crystal graphene. And you can think of uh, single crystal graphene looking a little bit like cling film, you know, you get on a roll. Um, a crystal in this context means a repeating pattern. So it's not actually, uh, graphene in this form, you could bend and uh, you could drop it on the floor and bounce it around, you could scrunch it up and look, it would handle a bit like cling film. And polycrystalline graphene, you could think of it as cling film with lots of holes and tears and things in it. And that's on the left hand side where the state of the art of manufacturing is down at the atomic level at the minute. So is it possible to make single crystal graphene? Because what we're talking about is a single molecule of graphene. And this means not only a single molecule, but we're going to have to make this at not only scales of centimetres, metres, but also kilometres to be industrial uh, manufacturer. Is it even possible to make single crystal graphene at sort of, let's say, metre scale? Well, it turns out, yes, it's already been done. This is work that's been done by Peking University in China. Uh, the way that they did it was, do you remember I showed you that uh, piece of metal foil with the uh, crazy paving? They got rid of that crazy paving by annealing the copper underneath to create a single crystal of metal. And then they grew the, copper, uh, the graphene on that. But cleverly, they arranged these hexagonal domains of graphene. So they all aligned. So when the domains grew together, they connected and locked together to create this single crystal, a single molecule. And they made a single molecule of graphene, which was 50 mil by 500 mil. Quite surprising, staggering. And you can see uh, that once the process optimization guys get onto this, then scaling up now is actually quite doable. 
interestingly, the Chinese have gone rather quiet on this. Um, we don't really know, do we, Mike, what, uh, what's going on in China? No, but uh, when they're not shouting about it, we think there must be something going on. Indeed, yes. Um, Oak Ridge National Laboratory in the States has already been uh, playing with this too. So we know it's possible to make single crystal graphene and uh, at large scales. Is it possible to make graphene at industrial speeds? Remember, graphene is only 16 years old. 16 years ago, it was thought impossible that this stuff could even exist. Now, people are actually making it at scale. This is what's uh, happening in Europe. You've probably heard of the graphene flagship. This is a billion euro um, program in Europe and they've funded Extron to uh, develop graphene. This is a fully automated machine which takes a roll of copper down through a vertical tube furnace and reels it up again at the bottom, growing graphene on there, and it can make 20,000 square metres of graphene a year. This particular unit is in the Geek in Manchester. This production line is another roll-to-roll -roll, uh, production line in the USA, General Graphene. They've actually created graphene on copper foil in a horizontal furnace, and then they can develop, they've solved the problem of getting the material off the copper onto a transfer sheet, and then they can transfer that to other machine, uh, other uh, stuff. And they've, they've got a capacity now, in the first quarter of next year, they'll be making 100,000 square meters of graphene. Remember, 16 years ago, this was impossible. And this is what it looks like. So you can see inside the uh, red circle, um, on, on the left-hand side, we've got polyethylene terephthalate film, which is plastic bottles stuff, you know, that clear plastic. Um, we've got then one layer of graphene grown, grown on it, transferred onto it, five layers, 10 layers. So these guys are not only growing the graphene at scale, they're doing the transfer at scale too. Still polycrystalline. And then finally in Korea, the Koreans have uh, just announced, and um, these have just come out in the last couple of months really, um, they've come out of a dark project and now they're making graphene at scales of a metre a minute. Staggering. Still stuck on the copper foil there. They've, they're struggling with the uh, transfer, but they'll get there. So graphene, impossible to industrial in 16 years. Um, you might have heard graphene is all hype. Believe me, it's coming out of its hype faster than anybody realises. The progress of this is astonishing. And I'm going to shut up now and hand over to Mike and he'll tell you about the commercial activity. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, obviously, we're just showing there the, uh, the uh, graphene and its two forms. Uh, to next slide. OK, I'll go through sort of the, some of the commercial application. It's really interesting that even uh, academics who are currently working in the field and researching graphene actually have missed the fact that the commercialization, the adoption of graphene and how it's moved forward. So it, it, even themselves, the, the, the way behind the curve. Um, and Adrian mentioned the hype curve earlier on. Now, the hype curve, you know, where the bubble burst, you know, there was a load of hype and how, how you know, uh, uh, beneficial this material is going to be and revolutionary and then it dropped away has really damaged the UK market and also the UK perception and the investment with it in, in, within the UK however the Australians who sort of missed that the Australians are driving forward and really taking it aggressively and adopting it in, in, in a huge way and also when we're in the US and you know on our relationship with the US as well the US have realized the opportunity of this and some of the challenges that we're getting now with rare earth metals and how a lot of the rare earth metals and, 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 and um, elements are being bought up uh, and so some of the challenges in the future and, and the hence with silver and some of these rare these, these rare metals that how they're, they're, they're going to be disappearing because of the level of use unless we can find a way of recycling them. So it's really it's it's really interesting. And, and then recently, I think last year we were involved in a Senate paper, weren't we, Adrian, uh, in terms of advising on the on the US government in terms of graphene and its application. So they're really taking this up and they're going to throw a lot of money behind this. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing that really did the inner hits is what I call the gra uh, also the Gore-Tex effect. If all of us old enough, you know, Gore-Tex jackets years ago when they were they were sort of uh, breathable material, stop you sweating but kept the rain off. Uh, but anything that was Gore-Tex, people just bought it to go into the shop. And at the moment, some people are using graphite, uh, graphene, sorry, and just throwing it into products, but actually not using it for its properties, just using it for its marketing name and that marketing hype. And we need to get past that. Anyway, to open up, uh, give you a few examples this evening. So Innovate uh, is a shoe manufacturer and they're using it in, their, in a range of their products so for the soles and they call the G-Grip range. Now, really interesting. Now, people are actually winning awards on this and breaking records. So, uh, for example, on the, um, the Pennine Way Run, there's a male and uh, female athletes have been breaking um are breaking records through this and, and it's because of the improved level of grip that's been created through uh, through the soles 
Uh, and obviously, you know, to create grip, you need a softer compound. If you need a softer compound, then you're going to get greater wear. But actually, with the application and the use of graphene, it's they're creating 50% stronger, more elastic, and also 50% hard, uh, hard wearing. Uh, in terms of the products and actually the soles are not wearing out now so this manufacturing innovator had to start reinforcing the uppers because the uppers are wearing out uh, before the uh, before the soles and they're actually adding kevlar into the uppers so th they're a little bit more expensive than the normal in the market but that, that may change with the volume but the cost actually comes with the kevlar that's been applied rather than the sole and you'll see on the left there we have a liquid graphene in the oxidized rubber compound um, uh, and then bef you know, before it's um, uh, Polymerization. Always get that. Have I got that right, Adrian? Always get that one wrong. Yeah, spot on, Mike. Yeah, okay. Next slide, please. Okay, this is a really interesting one, especially us in terms of what it were, you know, really top of the agenda is climate change. So, um, Perpetuous have done some trials and ran some tests on light commercial vehicles in the UK. And you can see there from the figures, so on average, they had a 40% increase in wear resistance over the regular use of the tire, improved, improved rolling resistance, which indicated 30% improvement in fuel economy. And just say that again, indicated a 30% improvement in fuel economy. Uh, and also um, the improvements in wet and ice breaking distances were improved by 40%. So that means you could use a winter tire throughout the year it would be greater durability, it wouldn't wear, uh, and it's incredible. And you'd say, well, what's, what's happened to this? And this is the frustration with the UK, it's not been adopted, it's gone to the US, and the US are starting to adopt it. So straight away, some real low-hanging low fruit in how we can save you know, the carbon capture, carbon issues, uh, resistance, and, and the reduction in, in sort of the uh, wastage of tyres and, and the recyclability, which again, we'll mention further on. Yeah, again, Adrian? Okay, yeah, well, Deidre and I were talking, actually, I missed this, this morning we were chatting through it, and when we mentioned the Perpetuous and the tyres, we actually forgot about the uh, the research that's been going on uh, with Director Plus in terms of uh, road um, a project with graphene in, in, in the road. So, as you can see there, so in April 2019, they developed a one-kilometre stretch in the Strada Provincial, uh, just outside Rome. Uh, and they uh, they put half of the road, so we don't know what it was, but half of the road, one either the left or the right hand side was in graphene and the other was uh, just as normal. And you can just see the, figure, the figures there in terms of um, in terms of the reduction in rutting, you know, there was uh, the, the, as in from the, the tracks left from tyres, 35% uh, uh, lower usage in terms of the 60%, 60 degrees C in terms of reduction of the road, a major improvements to the service life and fatigue resistance improvements on the uh, on the road was over 250%, which is, you know, incredible. And when you look at that in terms of the durability of the road, the less uh, likely to, to be able to lifting road us and probably less potholes as well. Mm. And now there's, uh, again, next slide, we've just thrown these in very quickly. You see, there's two councils in the UK have actually, and you know, hats off to them, are actually being innovative. So Oxford, you see, they've they've done a, a laid a 750 uh, meter st uh, stretch of, of surface, and again, they're not letting on whether which is left or right, uh, and they're they're, they're just uh, trialling that at the moment. And then next slide, we've got uh, Kent, uh, where again, uh, Kent have got a th 350 meter stretch, but you can see in terms of just the adoption of that and the the you know how we could reduce the CO2 footprint by reduction in the material required, re reducing the amount of roads that need laid because of the increased durability and that combined with the tyres as well, with fuel economies, etc. It's just, it's just incredible. Okay, next one. Now this leads on again, if you like, into the tyres, but Vivek uh, of Space Blue working out of the University of Manchester, fantastic guy, you know, you would want to employ this guy, lock him in a cellar and he just comes out with ideas. Now he's just commercialised a uh, graphene mat that's completely recycled from um, rubber tyres. Uh, and if you put that in context, in terms of the rubber tyre market, uh, um, most of our tyres from the UK perspective are, are shipped to India. Uh, and it, in, a, in a really bad way, they're, they're just burnt. Um, and so to give you an idea of figures, 48,000 tonnes were shipped from the UK in 2013. And now in 2018 or in 2018, there was 263,000 tonnes of tyres. 
that were shipped there. Uh, and you look in terms of, you know, the commercialization. So now he's able to turn that into matting, 100% recyclable. And you see the top left picture there, or maybe top right for you. I think there's a mirror image there from us here when Adrian was talking earlier. Um, you know, where rubber mats at the moment, they break up and they start to degrade fairly quickly. Where these, uh, this new product isn't. Uh, I've got one in the office. Adrian's got one. If you're interested, you can buy them for 30 pounds. I'll give them a bit of a plug. Uh, but, you know, in terms of the future of recyclability and, and, and then reduction of tyres and reusing of, of, um, of the tyres is just going to be incredible. And you look at it in terms of an international uh, perspective, two million tonnes of tyres a year are dumped. And if you look from space now, some of them are being shipped to Kuwait, Kuwait and just left in the desert. And you actually see these uh, these tyre mounds, you know, from space. Uh, and in terms of a figure as well, just in the daily uh, uses of tyres or the daily um, binning of tyres, basically, for want of a better word, 100,000 tyres uh, put to waste uh, every single day in the UK. And that doesn't include the global figures in terms of footwear, gloves and everything else that may go with it. So, again, a product that's been rebalanced and just because the application of a small amount of graphene and powder graphene that we put into there is amazing. Next one, Adrian. OK, Ford, this is a great one as well. We uh, we met um, when we were out in D.C., uh, Debbie Maluski, she's uh, global head of materials for Ford. Uh, and we, we struck up a really good relationship with, um, with Debbie. And in fact, actually, she was that interested. She's actually now purchased the journal to just to be able to keep ahead of what's happening in the graphene markets globally so they can position Ford. So um, I'm not sure of the date where it was, but they, um, it was about two, three years ago, I think. But, the, but basically, they, they sort of dismissed graphene themselves. And the, as Debbie had said, they brought in an intern to do a bit of work, stuck the intern in the corner, gave him some um, uh, graphene, and just said, play around with that. Within two months, they suddenly realized what, just by this intern playing around, the, the capabilities you can see there on the left, they found out through the materials that they were going to get a 70% um, noise reduction, 20% improvement in material properties, and a 30% heat endurance. Uh, and you can imagine the heat endurance and the conductivity that they were looking at it, how they can package up transmission and engines. They can make smaller spaces. You know, they can reduce the amount of plastics and, and uh, materials that have been used in there. And it's and it just, you know, incredible. And, and now, again, which they're not really shouting about, now graphene and with the materials has been applied to over a million cars. Well, it's a million a cars plus you know through the ford range and also with the, where they found and, and again by accident this 70 percent improvement in noise reduction in terms of the the the, the ride you know the uh, the comfort of the vehicle uh, and also the there's something we're looking at now is that how this noise reduction material can be applied within the aerospace industry and just think in terms of lighter material but also in terms of cabin and, and improvements in the environment for, for passengers um Incredible, as I mentioned, the conductivity of these those materials, uh, and even in PES at the moment, we're, we're developing a, a carbon a carbon fiber gearbox for a high performance vehicle. But now, with the introduction of of the, uh, the of uh, graphene uh, and and it, and its uh, its uh, transmission of of heat and and uh, thermal uh, capability, and also noise reduction, we're now to looking to repackage that already. And again, one thing interesting Debbie has said as well, they've done research through COVID. People are starting to use their cars as offices as well. So that noise reduction will help in that one as well. So it's pretty good. Okay, next one. Thanks, Adrian. Okay, this is uh, fairly uh, self-explanatory, but again, revolutionary. So the Briggs Automotive Company, BAC, based out of Liverpool, they're single-seat, high-performance road, road cars, but base, so basically an F1 car on the road. And they've done some uh, research and actually started to adopt it. So the first production car to incorporate graphene enhanced carbon fiber uh, composites in, in everyday body, uh, body panels. And you look there on the right, the figures there, graphene enhanced is 30% stronger. So lighter weight com components can be made and less material. So again, why is not this this not necessarily been adopted currently by the uh, you know, the automotive industry? And we're trying to push that to make sure the adoption comes in and you know turn the news around uh, the, all the positive news and messages about graphene. But again, this is a, a real live example of what's happening in in the automotive industry uh, at the front end and the bespoke side of the market currently. Next one, Adrian. Okay, this one's really interesting in terms of graphene and field effect transistors. Um, uh, and, and, and look at this. So basically, it's to it's basically to um, detect biochemicals within bloods, etc. Um, and you look, you see the small center in the dot, the dot in the center of the um, of the transistor there. Now that's that's graphene. Uh, and, and if you look at it in terms of the sort of spokes, the sort of 15 spokes, and then when the uh, biochemical or the anomaly comes into contact 
uh, with the graphene, it sends out a potential particular signal that can be measured. So therefore, one chip can can potentially um, measure, mul uh, carry out multiple tests up to, up to fifteen. Uh, and this has just improved the uh, the field effect transistors, you know, effect. So they're basically a lab on a chip. And Cordera, um, I believe that's a is it a um, an American company? Yeah. yeah so that they're able to produce nine thousand of these a day. Uh, and it's just really transforming this marketplace. I mean, do you want to add anything there in terms of that? No, you've done it pretty well, Mike. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, uh, the, and the key thing of the question is always there, does it detect, detect COVID? Yes, it does. Uh, so again, this has changed the markets and especially, uh, you know, with the pandemic and actually putting this at the fore. Mm -hmm. Next one, Adrian. I'll let Adrian do that because being the chemist, he probably understands a lot more <laughs> than that rather than the material side for me. <laughs> no problem, Mike. This is like a cross section through uh, field effect transistor, but um, it's very similar to the Cardia work. Uh, but this is separate work that's been done in Korea. Um, what you're looking at is um, basically silicon uh, substrate. And then you've got graphene laid on top of it, that black line. And then you've got the source and drain electrodes and a gate electrode, which applies an electric field. And you set the, um, the field effect transistor up so that with a voltage so that um, the current is constant. And then um, you can also treat the surface of the, uh, the graphene with uh, spike antibodies, which will respond to a particular biological molecule. In this case, it was SARS spike antibody protein. And the, the Koreans discovered that they could actually detect down to um, in incredibly tiny levels. So when the virus lands on one of these receptors, it changed the uh, way that the graphene conducts electricity. That's roughly what the field effect transistor is doing. But look at that. The detection was down to one femtogram. And, you know, you sort of lose the will to live trying to count all those noughts before you get to the one. Um, so incredibly tiny quantities of uh, virus can be detected by these uh, field effect transistors. So as Mike was saying, you know, labs on a chip and these things can be customised to detect all sorts of things. I'll hand back over to you, Mike. And that's why I knew you'd explain that better than I did, Adrian. Thank you. Next slide. Great. Yeah, these um, Hall effect sensors um, uh, produced by Paragraph. Uh, and they're changing this this marketplace as well. So in terms of Hall effect sensors, they 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 are really affected by have an adverse effect to neutron radiation unless they're encased or uh, uh, packaged against anti radiation anti radiation issues. So these trans transistors are perfect for the use in space and radioactive environments. Uh, and then through paragraph, they've just improved it. You can see the figures there. You know, they've they've just improved the use of this. You know, how they can go into these uh, these really uh, adverse environments, and, and and absolutely just by the application of graphene, enhance the effectiveness of the, these these Hall effect sensors. Uh, and again, the sensors are used in other markets. You know, with it, you know, in terms of on, on the Earth, so they're used in computer keyboards, switches. You know, measuring shaft uh, uh, shafts on car speeds, etc. Um, but there's been a revolution or there is about to be a revolutionary change in these marketplaces as well, especially there's more drive in the space and the space environment. Uh, some really good. Next slide, Adrian. Okay, I'll really go through quickly because I know we're running short on time, but Orbex uh, launch vehicle, UK based uh, company. So basically a low cost orbit launch uh, service company uh, due to commence in 2022, as it says there. So they're, they're able to deliver 150 uh, kilograms of payroll in, uh, payload into space. So uh, contained in the 1.3 meter nose. So basically Orbex uh, has a graphene enhanced carbon fiber composite body. Um, and, and interestingly enough, in terms of the, the engines, they were 3D printed. So the nozzles are 3D printed, obviously not in graphene, um, but they're, they're, they're printing. So you, you're ad adapting really interesting uh, technologies. I'll leave, I won't go on too much into that one. Uh, this one, again, uh, really interesting uh, in terms of some of the stuff that we, we've seen as well. Um, so, um, excuse me. Yeah, so basically anti-corrosion, anti so you can see there, so basically um, been placing onto steel panels on ships, so a 7% greater adhesive um, of the primer contained on uh, talphene to the steel panels, 14% greater adhesive of the subsequent anti-fouling co uh, coatings. And this has been placed on two uh, 300,000 ton container ships uh, at the moment. So this is done by Talga at the moment, an Australian firm. But again, when we were in DC, we were uh, met with uh, Applied Graphing Materials who are a UK based company. And we had a, a really interesting meeting with uh, uh, hosted by the uh, embassy and uh, British embassy in DC. 
and we were talking to the Americans and again through applied graphene materials, the, the, uh, the, uh, the US Navy are really interesting in this in terms of the cost saving applications. Yeah, and again, not only in terms of the anti-corrosive properties, but also, you know, ships and uh, having my time in the Navy as well in the past, ships have, you know, nearly five, six tons, if not more of paint built up of them over the life scale. And if you don't need new chip them off, so it affects the, uh, the cost effectiveness of the fuel, the weight, everything else. So really interesting market, but this is a billion, a billion dollar market um, and opportunities that can be taken from that. Okay, uh, Adrian. This one, I'm, I'm somebody, I bang the drum on this because uh, whether me sitting on the net zero commission and something I'm really passionate about, but um, uh, concrete. So this um, concrete, um, graphene enhanced concrete was, uh, they've used it to build this, uh, the 21st century convention center in Yucatan in Mexico. And also they, they loved it that much. They started building the roads and actually the hotels uh, out, of, out of this material. And as you can see, with just a 0.03% graphene oxide uh, by weight, uh, it increases basically the comprehensive strength of concrete by, um, by at least 25%, and we'll, we'll mention this later. But also, if you adopt that, that means 2% reduction in global CO2 emissions, which is just incredible. Again, low-hanging fruit and get really frustrated that, frustrated that this isn't adopted and taken forward. Now... Uh, the, one of the challenges with, with obviously the adoption is obviously concrete companies, you know, they're going to be selling 20% uh, less uh, of their products. So we needed to get governments involved in this, get a level of intervention to be able to uh, offset that, that potential loss. And also the certif certification of this material so it can be adopted, you know, right across the, the trade. You know, and you, and you just think how much concrete is used globally. So, yeah, a minimum of 2% saving on the global emissions almost immediately. Uh, and take that forward. Now, there are some variable effects, and we'll you know, pop onto the next slide, Adrian. You know, in terms of um, because of the mixing, with you know, you need to get some sort of control over this because uh, you know the, the variability. But yeah, gr Adrian did some research. You just see the table uh, or the chart or the bar chart on the left. It just said between graphene, graphene oxides, etc. So at worst, you're looking for a 12% improvement, and at best, you're looking over 45% improvement. And that's just potentially the inconsistencies on how, basically how it's mixed. But that can be improved, take, taken forward. And even the qu quality of the graphene now, you know, we have Roman spectrometers now that, that can really look at the graphene. Um, and, you know, from the point it's mined and refined. Uh, and this has become really consistent now. So again, you know, just incredible. And we'd say there, look at that, you know, those figures, 0.03% of use of graphene is a 25% increase in the... Uh, in the effectiveness and the strength of the concrete. And that means, again, if you add 25% more concrete, you're the strength of the material, you can build you know, larger buildings and greater capacity. Uh, and a figure there from Chatham House to say global cement production accounts for 8% of global CO2 emissions at the mobile. So if we can take 2% off that, again, it's just something that just can't be sniffed at. Incredible. And I'm really passionate about this because it is something, you know, never mind electric cars, let's just deal with what's already there and it could be changed overnight. Okay, Adrian. Um, so yeah, rounding up, you know, if you look, if you think graphene is overhyped, well, think again, it's not. It's moving at an incredible pace. And as Adrian said, 16 years ago, this, this stuff was in, impossible. And now we're moving at a pace. And, and you know, hence in terms of the, um, you know, what we're doing with uh, Nixine Publishing is that, you know, academics and, and the, you know, the automotive companies and industry are, you know, basically trying to keep, keep, keep ahead of the curve and then, you know, purchasing the, the um the journal of us because we are absolutely immersed in this on a on a day to day and a monthly basis. CVD graphene is now starting to make you know an appearance in sensors you know in terms of and how we're going to change the the world or how this product is going to change the world in terms of quantum computing and supercomputing is it, just incredible. And then graphene is basically the Swiss Army knife advanced materials, uh, and that's us. I think there, uh, Adrian, isn't it? So we can really, um, you know, hopefully got some time to answer the question. There was someone I noticed that answer, uh, asked it, will this uh, be disseminated? Uh, well, can you have a copy of this? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the, the team uh, will, will put this out today. So that's it from Adrian and I, and hopefully we can have some time. I think we're going to uh, get some questions put towards us. All right. Well, thank you very much, Mike. And thank you, Adrian, for the wonderful presentation. A huge amount of uh, variety of applications there. We've not had a huge amount of questions submitted, so if you'd like to ask a question or have a topic which you'd like Adrian and Mike to cover, please put that in the Q&A function now. And we'll try to pick those up as they come in. I've got a few questions noted down. Uh, I'll kick off with them. You haven't mentioned many about, much about electrical uh, uses of graphene products. Could you give us an insight into perhaps what some of those could be? You mentioned computing, but... 
Yeah, there's, can I take that mic? Yeah, absolutely. Um, electrical um, devices, uh, at the moment, there's a lot of work going on in sensors, as Mike has said, uh, with particularly around these field effect transistors, but you can actually use the graphene powders. Uh, there's a company in Spain that um, has developed um, a graphene ink, which you paint on the wall, and you can paint electric circuits on the wall and then you can just interact them with your hand and you've got a capacitive switch which can switch things on and off. So you can put, you can paint over it and it just disappears. So you no more digging out the plaster to um, put in sort of um, switching uh, data cables, that sort of thing. Um, it may be worth thing... answering about the cyber security side as well, which is a lot of people don't oh, know. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, if you If you can make, do you remember we talked about single crystal graphene? Um, once that can be made by these industrial processes and probably even the processes that are around at the minute, if you take that graphene uh, off these rolls and they can be made by the kilometer already, then you've got the ability to layer up multiple layers of graphene and use them as electrical wires. And now you can send data signals down through those wires and the outer layers of graphene would shield, provide an electromagnetic shield uh, for the signals that are going on inside. So you've got something which can't be accessed and cracked. Therefore, when quantum computing comes along and, uh, uh, and breaks all the codes, you've actually got the ability to create physical security in uh, data cable wires. Excellent. Excellent. Um, so a few people asking about whether the introduction of graphene materials affects the recyclability of products? It does in a positive way. So we can actually, uh, Mike talked about graphene in concrete, um, recycled concrete, uh, the aggregate, if you reuse that, it drops the strength by about 30, maybe 40%. The, there might be some specialist concrete guys in the audience who'll uh, tell us more precisely. Um, it turns out that um, by adding a bit of graphene, you can uh, bring that back up to the level of pristine uh, concrete. But also, if the graphene was in there in the first place, it would actually still contribute to the enhancement of the material as it comes around for the next phase of recycling. And the same sort of effect is being discovered in polymers as well. Graphene composites can be recycled and they are a bit stronger than you would find if they were um, uh, without containing graphene. And I think what we mentioned earlier as well, the, you know, the new technology has just come out in terms of extracting carbon from, you know, plastics, etc. So that, that level of recyclability, and again, we opened opening up landfill sites, recycling. So again, almost it, you can reconstitute anything. So once you're going to scrap it, as long as you can, you know, turn it to, to carbon and then bring it back into the, the graphene form, etc., cetera, is, is going to be a, an incredible advancement. And also hopefully they'll, they'll be, they'll be capturing carbon in, um, in, in, you know, tons out of the atmosphere eventually, and then we'll be able to reuse that again uh, and to, you know, full recycle and then, um, you know, sort of um, uh, the full cyclical uh, approach to, uh, to, to, to recycling. Okay. You've mentioned obviously a lot about the addition of graphene to polymers type materials. What exactly is it about the, the graphene being present that enhances the properties of these materials? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, the, the platelets of graphene uh, have got the ability to bridge the polymer chains and the, the polymer can actually grab hold of the graphene, particularly if it's been functionalized with another compound. Um, give you an example, um, something humble like polyethylene pipes, you know, the, the stuff that's used to transport gas and water around, buried in the ground. There's a problem at the minute, they've um, they're tested to a certain bar. I think it, the, the current... Um, uh, class of material is, a, is something called P80 from memory. I think they want to go up to P125, which means you've got to make a thinner pipe that can take um, 125 bar uh, or megapascals of pressure um, for 50 years. And so you've got to use less material that's stronger. And everybody in the plastics industry has been stumped about this. There's a company in Australia that's just cracked this. And uh, this was announced just this year. They've, uh, they've actually managed to create a graphene uh, polymer composite, which can now create these PE125 pipes. So they're thinner, which means you can get more material down through them, and they're stronger, meaning that um, they'll withstand the pressures and they'll last for the lifetime of the pipes. 
So it's a huge amount of going on in uh, polymer composites. That, that's just the tip of the iceberg. And it may be interesting, we mentioned earlier, in terms of how little graphene is applied to, uh, yeah. to a potential product, isn't it? And I think that was where we had all the issues of the hype curve, that people were just throwing kilograms of this stuff into... Uh, into mixes and different compounds to try and come out with a solution and, and nothing was working. And as we said there with the concrete in terms of volume, 0.03% gives you a 25% increase, you know, in performance it is incredible. And uh, Liam asked a question about that. He said, uh, why do you only add 0.03% and not more? That the reason Liam is, uh, because if you add more, it actually gets worse. So there's like a, an optimum that you uh, come across and it's right down at the, uh, the lower end, way, way less than you'd ever think. And people only discovered this by accident. And it really is that less is more in the world of graphene. And that applies to concrete. It also applies to polymers um, and lots of other composites. So you, you're adding a lot less graphene than you would ever thought. And this sort of addresses another thing, which might be one of the questions, uh, I haven't seen these, uh, Andrew, but um, about graphene being expensive. It did originally start off being expensive, but um, again, now even the expensive stuff, if you're adding tiny quantities, then it actually is creating a benefit that you can then create added value for the customer and that um, doesn't, imp uh, doesn't impact the cost. Okay. I was on that topic to say so. Um, are there standards being generated for graphene products and classifications of graphene products, like international standards, so you can buy a standardised product? Yep. Uh, the International Standards Organisation, uh, there's a sp uh, special committee, is it TC225, uh, run by Dennis Koltsov, and um, that's for nanomaterials, including graphene, and there is an international cooperation, a collaboration effort um, with Dennis. There's a chap called Ray Gibbs who's working out of the geek uh, on this. They're uh, talking with big manufacturers in America, in China, Europe, connecting everything together. So there's a massive international push behind the scenes to get these standards right and embed that in the supply chain. Yeah, and it was interesting through that, wasn't it? Because we were part of that quality control uh, debate in, in, in Washington. Yeah. Um, and at the time it was what is graphene and when does it become graphite so it was sub sub 10 layers so three to 10 layers is graphene uh, and then thereafter it's graphite and, and and interesting we were talking to um uh some of the suppliers and, and, and andrew wasn't it at uh, first graphene you know it's almost you know a lot of people say well it doesn't really matter because you know in, in some of it they're using graphite but they're still getting a 40 percent improvement so it doesn't matter you know whether it's graphene or graphite if you graphite if you're starting to get those levels of performance improvement and saving on materials as well i mean so so for, for example first graphene now i've just developed and got into partnership in australia they've developed a swimming pool so glass reinforced plastic they've they've reduced the amount i think it's by 40 percent isn't it um adrian yep. So about 40% of the material that goes into the swimming pools, it's UV stable. And now that's gone into production. Uh, again, so real benefits. And, and again, so in many ways, yes, there is a standard. And, and I think half the, half the debate in DC was, you know, basically if you can call it graphene, I can charge more for it. If it's not, and if it's graphene, I can charge less. Um, mm. So uh, to us, it's just how well it performs, you know, in terms of the application. Yeah. But people are actually getting a handle on measuring graphene. And Andrew, I see Antonia has asked uh, what instruments and techniques are used to detect the defects uh, in graphene. Um, it, um, it was uh, things like atomic force microscopes. This is um, effectively a very sharp, atomically precise pointy stick that you drag over a surface um, to count the number of layers, a bit like dragging your fingernail down the edge of some paper. Um, but uh, and electron microscopes, but they're not really quality control techniques. They need to be operated by expensive technicians in expensive rooms. But there's um, a technique called Raman spectroscopy, which is basically shining a laser at uh, something and then looking at the light that's scattered back. So you fire a, a laser beam with a very precise wavelength, and then you look at the light that's reflected back, but you block that precise wavelength that's coming back. So none of the incident light it, allow, it go, comes back to the detector, but you still see light coming back. And what's happened is uh, the laser has interacted with the graphene and then it gets scattered at different wavelengths on either side. And then using that pattern, you can deduce um, what defects there are. So you can tell if it's SP2 or SP3 carbon, you can uh, look for uh, holes, vacancies, things like that. Um, these machines used to be 100,000 odd pounds. And now they've actually, uh, Mike mentioned first graphene, 
they're working with Metro now. They've just got a Roman um, uh, device, which is probably about that big, probably about 40 centimetres max, uh, that you can just slide um, a sample underneath, press a button, and it tells you how many layers, what sort of defects you've got. And that can be operated by process technicians. And they're using the data from that in their statistical process control. So getting really sophisticated measurement techniques um, made bulletproof and being applied to industrial manufacture of graphene already. Thanks, well, and I suppose that's a good place to end. Industrialization is really um, becoming practical. I'll hand over now to our secretary, Mark Tomlinson, uh, who will give you a vote of thanks. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mike and Adrian. Uh, I suppose there was always a, a, a concern when we said we were going to have a, a, a talk about uh, carbon 2D materials, that it might be a little bit flat and grey, but uh, I think you've both done a really good job uh, making uh, a really entertaining talk this evening, plenty of depth and colour. Um, I thought the, the structure of the talk was really good. We got to talk about the different forms of graphene uh, and about the equipment that, uh, that makes them. Um, I thought it's really interesting to, to learn that uh, some, of these, some of these pieces of equipment might have the, the real prospect of making the the most difficult thing of all, and, and that's money out of uh, out of a new product. Um, and it was really great to see the the, the 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 sheer breadth of products that Mike talked about for all around the world um, that that people are developing. Uh, I, I think we've all learned something tonight, uh, and and I think we're uh, we're richer because of it. So thank you very much to both of you. Um, as is our tradition, we've uh, we've sent you a little gift. Um, I think Adrian's made still be in, in the office, but uh, Mike's has arrived. Uh, it's our little tankard. I'm afraid it, it doesn't really have much to do with graphene, but um, but if you do drink too much beer out of it, 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 it could turn you horizontal. So uh, just, just be aware of that. Um, our next event uh, is in uh, the 2nd of February. That will be Chris McDonald, the, the CEO of the Materials Processing Institute. He is uh, has agreed to talk to us about digital technologies in steelmaking. Uh, there's a, a huge amount of work going on at the moment to take advantage of the advantages of the advances rather in uh, in industry four, big data and uh, and improved methods of measurement and control. So that should be a really interesting talk. Um, as Mike said, a lot of people have uh, have asked about uh, the availability of tonight's slides and uh, and hopefully a video of the of the proceedings. Um, if you would like to receive a copy of the slides, I think probably the easiest thing to do is to email uh, me. So that is secretary at smea1894.com. If you send me that through, then I'll make sure that that uh, you get a copy of the slides sent to you. Um, also, as soon as I can find a, a 10, 13 year old to teach me how to do a YouTube channel, then uh, we will attempt to take the recordings that we've made of these lectures, uh, get the approval of the presenters and then make those available for you. So uh, you might have to give me a little bit of time to do that, but uh, we'll, we'll see what happens and hopefully in the new year we can get that set up. Um, so all that remains is to say thank you to everyone for attending. Thank you again to the speakers for their excellent talk and, uh, and the way they, they answered all our questions. And uh, hopefully have a good Christmas. We will see you in February. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye bye.